Hello, everyone, and welcome. I want to thank everyone for supporting this Funds for Minds iConnections event, as proceeds will go towards mental health charities. Today, we will be talking about COVID-driven surprises in private credit. My name is Sally Bakewell, and I run the financial news team at Bloomberg News, and I'll be moderating. So we'll start with an introduction of the panelists, and Rob, if you'd like to go first. Sure. Robert Thompson, Senior Portfolio Manager for UPS. Uh, UPS is a roughly, and we, we manage roughly about $51 billion of assets for three defined benefit plans. Um, I'm responsible for the credit portfolio. Uh, our credit portfolio is roughly about $2.4 billion of NAV. We have about 900 million of unfunded exposures and commitments. Um, it's, it's also a combination of private and public credit. So roughly about 50% of the, our credit portfolio is public, 50% is private. We, uh, we additionally work with third-party managers in order to source the allocation in the public sphere. Um, some of our allocations include mandates and high yield, credit derivatives, uh, global bonds, leverage loans, uh, additionally uh, CLOs. Uh, in private credit, we, uh, we allocate to direct lending, distressed debt, specialty finance, second lien MES, so across the credit spectrum. But it's a pleasure to be here as well. Thanks, Rob. Okay, um, over to you, Tim. Yeah, hi, everyone. I'm Tim Warwick, and I am uh, with Principal and uh, part of Principal Global Investors, our asset management organization, with around $550 billion in assets under management. And then within that, I'm part of Principal Global Fixed Income with $170 billion of assets under management. And my key focus uh, for many years has been credit, where we manage around $80 billion and within that credit, we manage around $8 billion of private credit. And um, some of my history, I've, I've had a lot of roles, much of my career with principal. I've had the opportunity to start as a private credit analyst, manage our general account, uh, manage credit portfolios and core plus portfolios for institutional clients all around the world. And over the last three years, been focused on building out our private middle market uh, direct lending effort and platform and team. So uh, really exciting and great opportunity given the market environment that we've seen over the past few years. Thank you, Tim. And last but not least, Don. Um, I'm Don Mullen. I'm the founder of Predium, which is uh, an alternative investment manager uh, focusing on resi and corporate credit. Uh, prior to starting this firm in 2012, I spent 30 years on Wall Street. Uh, most uh, recently at Goldman Sachs, where I ran global credit and global mortgages. Uh, very happy to be here and very happy to support this organization. Thanks, everybody. And with that, I'm going to kick it off with the first question. Um, so what surprised you most, given the COVID-19 crisis, relative to your outlook coming into 2020? And given this, how did you take advantage of opportunities and reposition your portfolios? So I'm going to direct that question first to Rob. Yeah, I, I think anybody who came out of the GFC, um, we were sort of, you know, like in my back of my mind, I was sort of expecting a similar all hands on deck mentality. And uh, COVID-19 was anything but. Um, I think I was really surprised by just the speed and the force of the sell off. Um, when we look back and we see five of the 10 worst trading days in high yield history occurred during COVID-19 in that month of March. Uh, additionally, VIX goes all the way to 82. Um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a forceful sell-off. Uh, we took advantage by uh, you know, allocating some more dollars in the public markets. We saw high yield spreads were roughly about 1,073 basis points on March 23rd. We made a, you know, a man, you know, additional allocation to our credit derivatives uh, as well as uh, you know, our high yield strategies. But then additionally, after that, uh, we started taking a look at you know, other opportunities in private credit whether it be specialty finance, where we felt like we could get a nice, uh, you know, risk-adjusted return of 10 plus percent. Secondly, in MES, uh, we also did some direct lending, but all in, um, you know, it was, it was a great opportunity to allocate last year uh, if you had, you know, if you, you were solid with your timing and also taking advantage of the opportunities that were present. But it was scary. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I didn't mean, that was, that was a laugh in empathy, not a laugh yeah. in... Uh, uh, anything but sharing the experience. I guess I'll jump in next then. And um, to build on that laugh and empathy, it was uh, a hell of a second quarter, that's for sure. I mean, we started the year with the expectation of seeing a modest increase in defaults. Uh, we started the year with the expectation that uh, previous underwriting standards, which we had seen as declining generally, 
would have caused that increase in defaults, even with an otherwise robust economy. Um, as, as Rob said, we ended up with this extraordinary sell-off. And I think the thing that was most surprising to me was the scale of the intervention by both the Fed and fiscal policy was so extremely large. Uh, and I had become attuned to previous policy responses, which were far less effective than this one was. I think I had misjudged, uh, quite frankly, when a crisis occurs in the presidential election cycle has a big impact on the scale of the policy response. So the fact that this occurred early enough in the election cycle that all forces could conspire to attack it, the House, the Senate, the president, in a way different than when it occurs too late in the election cycle, like the GFC, and then the new president's trying to pass a bill with a divided Congress had a big impact versus it occurring in the second quarter prior to a presidential election. So the scale of the response was much multiples larger than the GFC. The Fed was even more aggressive by using a credit QE, not just rate QE in our mind. And so as a result, we usually would see in a cycle like this, like a capital goods recession. And we didn't see that. You couldn't, there were no cars left to buy in September of last year. There were no trailer homes to buy. There were no boats left to buy. That was all gone. It was a service-based recession that take, took place, which was very surprising to us. Um, and in addition to that, the impact on housing stock was really shocking uh, to many people because in the past, there was an expectation of declines in house prices are at least grinding to a halt. And the combination of work from home, pulling forward pent up demographics and forbearance policy, which took houses out of the normal eviction and foreclosure process, created no supply with insane demand. And so the biggest surprises for us are those, uh, the, um, the growth in capital goods demand, increasing house prices, and we took advantage of it by first expecting to capture more credit quality, uh, poor, poor good credit sold at bad prices, Instead, we were forced to roll the recovery in corporate credit. And obviously, we continued to build our product set and our houses portfolio in single family homes. Great. Thank you, Don. And to Tim, for your thoughts, please. Yeah, I'll uh, add on in the great comments by Rob and Don. Uh, we definitely were going into the cycle pre COVID, uh, seeing that stretched valuations, uh, kind of stretched underwriting standards as well. Uh, and, and we were expecting near end of cycle to, to be uh, somewhat imminent over the next year or two, but a deep V-shaped recovery or a deep V-shaped downward move uh, in the COVID period was quite dramatic and really cleaned things out and created systemic risk that had to be addressed, as Don mentioned, by all the uh, forces, monetary and fiscal, that were very coordinated. Uh, so a big surprise or some surprise was just the, the quick recovery in financial markets and liquidity. So really... Few investors had a chance to buy liquid assets at the distressed levels. Um, it was more about what we could do and how we focused on the middle market direct lending capabilities that we had. So it was really a great opportunity for us to continue to ramp our portfolio, to be able to invest in companies that were clearly uh, either not affected or, or only mildly affected by the COVID downturn. And we could underwrite through that cycle, which is a new type of cycle, and still get even better and improved uh, pricing, structure, and covenants, you know, LIBOR floor. Uh, so tremendous risk-adjusted returns and opportunities through that vintage. And I think that'll be proven out over time. And many of the other larger direct lending firms that have grown up over the last 10 years really decided they've got a lot of portfolio companies that were having issues um, in leisure and travel and such and entertainment. So they really started reducing their hold size, looking for more diversification, kind of moving to the sidelines. So for us, as we continue to ramp and develop and build our platform, it really was a great opportunity to, to, take, to take advantage of the 2020 vintage of middle market direct lending loans. Thanks, Tim. And actually, we're going to stick with you and talk about risk. Um, where do you see the greatest risks, both at a macro level and in private credit? Yeah, I think uh, we're hitting on it a number of times today. I think, ironically, you know, the, the growth is really accelerating now around the globe and, and the recovery is accelerating, of course, driving that growth and driving consumer spending, 
and confidence, and of course, some of the stimulus driving income to help support that. But I think uh, the real risk is, is what's gotten us back to this recovery is the removal of the excessive accommodation and, and how do you measure excessive. It, it probably is getting to that point now. It wasn't when it was needed back in March, but that's going to be a, a very fine uh, you know, needle to thread, so to speak, because the Fed is going to have to talk down the quantitative easing first before they remove zero interest rate policy. And the market's going to try to preempt the Fed uh, as we can see in various days in the market where the market tries to anticipate and move rates higher, uh, that causes volatility in longer duration assets, including uh, longer duration stocks, which have earnings growth potential and power out, the, out into, into future years. So to us, the biggest risk right now is ultimately policy adjustment. And that's the biggest macro risk. And ultimately what that does, as Don was talking about earlier, we pulled forward and we'll continue to pull forward a lot of demand. Um, of course, if there's been supply constraints recently that have pushed up prices. We don't think inflation, we do believe it's more transitory, like the Fed says, other than some of it being structural and maybe housing and some other uh, more permanent structures like that. But we do believe uh, a key risk is just the ability for the Fed to transition uh, that policy and, and to be able to adapt um, uh, as things change and as that demand is pulled forward. So we're pulling demand forward. Uh, so significantly. So in the future years, I think that really suggests there's a higher and higher likelihood of recession when there's less tools in the kit for the Fed and the government to support through fiscal stimulus. So that's what we see as a key risk. Um, and as far as some of the key uh, risks within the, the business, middle market private credit business, uh, we see probably more than likely the stretch valuation in the, in the public market kind of melding into the upper end of the private credit markets. Um, that's probably more of a private equity sponsor concern, and many of them are becoming more, much more disciplined and just not reaching for those 15 to 20 multiple type of companies. But some of them are doing that, and then some lenders, of course, will lend it you know, higher than six times even on those companies as well. So some of that's going to get a little stretched, but we still believe that even in a recession that's ultimately going to happen, that uh, we're going to be covered well, well over uh, what's necessary given the first lane focus uh, that the middle market private credit market provides. Great, thank you. And Rob, your thoughts, please. I, I mean, you know, for, for me, and, and, and I'm not by any stretch of the imagination proclaiming a 1970s inflation cycle, but just to see the, the sharp inflation um, moves that we've had to start of the year, um, to see five-year inflation go from like 1.96 to 2.71. But then you also look at the front end of the treasury curve and you see zero rates. Um, that's, that's somewhat concerning for me. So um, I, I, I really enjoyed and appreciate both Don and Tim's comments regarding the fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus from a recovery perspective. I, I'm not very concerned when it comes to uh, defaults um, you know, in, in corporate credit for this year. But I would say that one of the strengths of private credit is the floating rate exposure that you have. Um, so I, I do look at, you know, for instance, on middle market direct lending and thinking about, uh, you know, that floating rate aspect and what could potentially uh, be uh, rising rates, you know, from that perspective. Um, I, I'm happy to say that, look, I mean, duration is one of the things so, I mean, you know, that I'm, I'm a bit nervous of, you know, for, for this year, um, especially on the front end of the curve. But I would say that, uh, you know, in general, that the biggest risk that I see on, on private credit is just some of the things that whether it be adjusted EBITDA, whether it be quality underwriting, just making sure your managers are, um, you know, really sharpening the pencils and, uh, you know, doing everything they can for any potential workouts. I don't think that's going to be something, you know, main focus. I think that, you know, the defaults um, are going to be minimized, you know, just given the cycle. Uh, but I would say that, you know, the, the biggest thing right now that, you know, we care about is just quality underwriting. From our for our managers. Great, thank you, Rob. And to Don. So we think about macro risks. Um, for us, um, we're pretty focused on what we think uh, should be the unexpected items to be focused on. So while inflation seems to be front of mind for everyone and creating near-term volatility, um, I still keep an eye on the fact that there's 10 million workers who haven't re-entered the labor force that technology was really employed by a lot of companies over the last year to replace human beings. And so is that combination of those labor force coming back in to work, the increase in the use of technology, 
creating a really significant change in productivity. Uh, while our economists would disagree with me, uh, me on this statement, for several years, I've been concerned that we're not measuring productivity ac accurately. And that's one of the reasons why we're probably in a position that we've had a low inflation environment with pretty rapid growth, particularly with the uh, pretty heavily heavy fiscal stimulus prior to COVID. But in addition to that, I think there's a litany of other risks that could add to volatility. You know, we, uh, on a macro level, a true macro level, it's hard to say that we're not in the midst of some new version of the Cold War between the US, China, and Russia. And when I think about that, I don't really know who did the colonial pipeline hack, but the reality of it is I expect more of problems like that. I expect to see this Cold War heat up in a way different than the last Cold War, because history never repeats itself. I guess the joke is it rhymes. And so we should see more Cold War tensions between these three, uh, two superpowers and a stunted, angry, uh, diminished superpower in Russia. Uh, and so as a result, I think that'll create more uh, volatility as we de-emphasize COVID and focus more on the true health, wealth, and position of the U.S. and the world. The way that transitions into investing, you know, I agree with my colleagues that you, know, you have to keep a, a fine eye on underwriting standards of what you're looking at and buying. People have been concerned that both equity markets, considering volatility that should enter the, enter the marketplace, as well as we've underwritten and credit new sectors that don't have the traditional hard asset backings in some cases, but have had better business prospects than companies that in the past had hard assets. You know, yes, I'd rather have a tech company today than a company that makes coal, that's for sure. Um, but I think it, it'll cause us to go through a cycle of change and understand truly the value of intellectual property better than we have it in the past. Ourselves as a manager and as a, a person working with clients investing in, in products like this, we've seen a move towards more residential private credit as a way to reduce their corporate exposure. We've seen the same phenomenon that created corporate private credit, which is a reduction of uh, exposure by banks and an increase of a need for structural creativity on the part of borrowers. We've seen that take place in the U.S. resi system. And so whether it's non-QM lending, whether it's construction lending, whether it's land lending, whether it's fix and flip or even uh, do-it-yourself lending, we see more of that taking place outside the banking system today. And so in this case, I'd expect us to see a blossoming new sector of new private credit, but new resi private credit. That's great. Thank you, Don. In fact, we can dig a little bit deeper into that with you now. Um, looking ahead, where do you see the best opportunities in the private credit market? Well, you know, the risk you always have is that people accuse you of speaking your book. So uh, these two gentlemen have great experience in uh, U.S. corporate private credit. Um, obviously, I have a pretty good experience. I lived through the GFC and the years uh, running up to it at Goldman Sachs running mortgages and, and saw post facto the regulation of banks out of parts of the mortgage system, similar to what we did to try to reduce systemic exposure uh, by banks and other institutions in credit risk. And that's created this, what we think of as a really attractive opportunity set to um, work with platforms that look in many ways like some of these corporate credit platforms, lending to uh, people trying to ameliorate the housing crisis that we have. No one's doing that, I'd say, uh, on a public policy basis, I meaning it's all capitalists trying to build houses to make money or build housing. But there is not the availability of traditional capital as it had been in the housing sector for decades. And so when we see um, opportunities, uh, lending, uh, again, to construction teams, lend, uh, companies, lending to small fix and flip, lending to uh, land development companies, as I mentioned, all of these are far more attractive than they'd ever been in any other cycle. The yields and returns are much safer and the advance rates are better. And it's an area that it's hard for capital access. So you need to have a good guide to help you get into that space. And so... Um, we think that's an area that, um, like many areas we try to focus on, areas it's hard for capital to access, and as a result, pricing and risk remain rational. 
And Rob, best opportunities in private credit. I, I'd say that uh, yeah, if you can access high quality floating rate paper with uh, meaningful yield, those those opportunities, and additionally, you have some sort of uh, proprietary financing source. Um, I, I love finding things, guys, that if I can get one and a half to two and a half times expected loss coverage, but meaningful yield, and you can compare that to the public bond market, that really gets me excited. Um, I, I'd also say that, uh, you know, so when we look at things and we go, okay, for instance, if we can find a second lien um, opportunity, it might have six to seven turns of leverage on it, but we feel like we're very confident there's going to be strong EBITDA growth. Those, we're, we're sometimes willing and, you know, comfortable to take that risk. Um, I, I'd also add that just given the macro comments that we had earlier, I look at like CLO equity ARB and, you know, it's, I, I, I know it's CLO equities, you know, probably considered a public asset class, but I look at it and go, it's probably 12% type return. It might be, you know, have, have significant leverage in it, but I think that, you know, something can give us three to four points of quarterly income. That's pretty, that's pretty attractive currently given sort of our default and forecast views. Um, but, but to be honest with you, there's, it's, you know, for in our shares, uh, it's, it can be tough, honestly, you know, to look across and see, wow, the, you know, the, the opportunities um, this year have been a little bit tougher to find than, than last year in nature. Got it. Thanks, Rob. And Tim? Yeah, I would add in, uh, folks, a little bit more on uh, private credit in the middle market space, but I think one area we see a lot of value still is the lower end to core, tr true core middle market. And that's the, we would say, uh, our definition is seven and a half million to $50 million EBITDA companies. And those companies are still, if you can find the right ones, work with the right private equity sponsors, work with the right family offices and borrowers. You can identify those companies that are really creating efficiencies, benefiting from secular changes in the economy. Uh, Don talked about technology, but technology, healthcare, business services, commercial services generally, that really create efficiencies that are gonna drive that productivity that we've talked about previously that are getting increasing but uh, at uh, strong growth rates as well as multiples that can be applied to those companies. So the thing we see is much less competitive than the upper middle market and obviously it's very much less competitive to, than broadly syndicated loans or public high yield. And uh, so we're able to get you know, true maintenance covenants. We're able to get uh, better structure in general around that, um, also better pricing. So right now, if you look long-term, the average spread premium versus public high yield or public uh, broadly syndicated loans is around 120 basis points. Uh, right now, the upper middle market is probably achieving 150 to 175 versus public high yield and lower middle markets around 250 to 350 basis points of incremental pickup. And that's what we're achieving right now um, in addition to that, and even on the portfolio basis for everything we've originated over the last year or so. Better covenants, lower default expectations, avoiding the cyclical industries, and uh, we just think there's a lot of tremendous value still. Part of it's because public assets are getting so rich and mispriced because of the uh, excess accommodation and quantitative easing, forcing investors into that space and passive funds into that space. But a lot of it's true, um, you know, getting paid for credit risk, liquidity risk, and the extra premium for the less efficient market. Okay, um, Tim, we'll stay with you and you just touched on it. Um, but this massive amount of stimulus, how have you thought about the impact of unprecedented monetary and fiscal policies on the value of fixed income sectors, public credit as compared to private credit? Yeah, and, and there's where we definitely see uh, a considerable difference in um, price takers versus price makers. That's the way we think about it. And if you think about a big picture, you're, there's so many price takers out there right now. The central banks around the world are price takers. Passive funds are price takers. And on the equity side, you can kind of justify some of the passive investment uh, that's going on there because you're based on market cap and, and assess productivity and, and value of firms. But on the debt side, it makes no sense to be buying things irregardless of price, ir irregardless of risk. Um, you're effectively funding as a passive investor, funding the bigger, the biggest issuers of debt. Um, so that that in, back in early recessions like 2002, for many of us, that's WorldCom, that's Enron, that's those kind of names that really nobody wants to have more exposure to. So we really think it makes a lot of sense. Um, plus, then you look at zero interest rate policy, negative real rates, 
quantitative easing, you know, all that puts pressure on investors that would like to invest rationally to go and look away from treasuries, away from mortgages into public credit and whatever vehicle they can get access to. And many of them are not yet accessing private credit. Uh, more and more, we'll see those trends continue to increase as products and offerings continue to expand. But uh, we, see, um, we see that as really being significant as the Fed takes out that extra supply and really uh, is, is the incremental buyer that's uh, buying it regardless of price. So uh, we think from private credit, there's a lot of discernment. Um, private credit has very steady capital. Private credit has capital that's backed by long-term liabilities, such as pension liabilities or insurance liabilities. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why that capital can be patient and, and hopefully most investors have a, and can have and afford to have a long-term investment horizon. But that capital is being deployed and invested truly based on credit risk. What should we get paid for the credit, the structure, liquidity, and then what additional excess performance are we going to generate for our investors? So we really believe that's essential to be a price maker rather than a price taker. And that's why private assets in general are much more attractive in our mind than, than public assets, especially when there's this much intervention in the system, uh, which will cause volatility of public prices that will swing around and, and um, they'll be rich for a long period of time and then cheapen for a short period of time, not many investors can get invested and then they'll richen up again. So it's really a, a tough game, whereas a long-term investor really can benefit from private asset classes, especially private credit. Okay, thank you. Rob, same question to you. Um, I, I Look, I, I'd love a high risk free rate. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we've been, you know, financial repression has been punishing uh, for savers and we continue to see just, you know, zero rates. Um, I, I'd say in general, um, we do believe in the value of the public markets. Uh, we, we, when we get an opportunity to, um, we, we have allocations. We, uh, we truly believe that there is a, a value to that, you know, to, to participating there. Uh, but if I had to say, looking forward in 2021, you know, we're spending most of our time from a sourcing perspective. It is almost exclusively private markets related. And it's due to the opportunity set. It's due to where we see, um, you know, the, the lack of opportunity in high yield, for instance. High yield is roughly like four to four and a half percent, 330 basis points of spread. When we think about, well, can we potentially extract more with liquidity premium, um, work to, to pace out assets, be higher than the capital structure, there's some value uh, in direct lending. Uh, but that doesn't also mean that, like, look, we, we've, got, we've had some skepticism in distressed debt. Uh, we don't like everything in private credit. We, we more than anything want to use our, our capital um, where we see value and additionally where we, we see opportunity. Okay, thank you. And Don? Well, first, you know, I'd say the uh, unprecedented monetary policy. I quote um, Rob's earlier comment. Certainly, CLO equity is one of the attractive assets in a low default probability, tightening spread environment where uh, ABS seems to be tightening a little bit faster than bank debt right now. So the ARB is a very attractive one. And it's a pro arguably on a risk-adjusted basis, maybe one of the most attractive ARBs we've ever seen in CLOs. So I agree with them on that. I'd say overall, it's a better market to be a debt issuer than it is to be a debt buyer. So the way our business is structured, we have a fair number of businesses that have illiquid assets that we purchase and then fund them in the markets. And that ARB has never been better. So single family homes financed in the marketplace today, despite the fact you have to pay more, our yields look more attractive than they did during uh, pre-COVID times. So uh, both not just our financing, but our realized net yield after debt and operating costs. So we think it's a good market to be in the business of having a illiquid liquid ARB on right now, buying illiquid assets if you know how to manage them. And finance them in liquid markets. It's a great business to be in. We do that in single family rentals. We do it in resi credit. And even though bank loans are liquid and they're not as liquid necessarily as ABS and certainly not as cap charge friendly. And as a result, we continue to see that uh, the market right now is uh, very attractive for that ARB. And that's how we plan to continue to play it for a bit. Okay, thank you, Don. Um, speaking of liquidity, a question for you, Rob. How do you compare the liquidity offered by public credit markets compared to the less liquid private credit market? And how should we think about the expected liquidity risk premium? 
I, you know, typically when we're trying to think uh, through, we one of the reasons why we evaluate private credit and public credit within the same portfolio is we're trying to frame out and get a get a sense of relative value. So I will look at broadly syndicated loans, for instance, against private credit. I expect to hopefully pick up 150 to 200 basis points of liquidity premium. And I pick that up through OID, syndicated fee, some sort of fee structure. And then additionally, um, we hope to also pick up some alpha from you know, the aspect that, for instance, like the, the leverage loan market right now is pricing in like roughly a 3.5% default rate, according to JP Morgan. Hopefully, our manager has, uh, has a better experience in that perspective. So I'd say that just in general, I mean, like when we think about relative value per se, uh, it, it comes from trying to compare like for like. But then additionally, um, you know, try, you know I, I think the biggest surprise that we've had over recently those, this past year is just the size of these companies that have actually um, went to the private markets. Uh, there was one in particular, I remember it was Bombardier, which is roughly like a billion dollar issue. And they went to the, the private markets for certainty, speed and execution. Um, I think you do see some of those opportunities. And then to Tim's earlier comments, um, you might also see some you know, opportunities in middle or lower middle market, you know, especially when it comes from spread premium. In. Thank you. Back to you, Don. Um, expected liquidity risk premiums? Yeah, I'd say that you know, um, my view is that they've been generally declining. But um, while they may be as attractive as Tim uh, described, the demand by investors that we speak to, at least, for uh, assets that have that incremental return, that don't have the uh, volatility that the public markets bring, that's a big issue for a lot of people. But, and, and was an issue prior to second quarter of last year. And the second, third quarter of last year made people even more horrified at the way public markets sometimes behave. And I don't think things like and I'll probably get myself in trouble here, but not as much as Elon Musk gets himself in trouble. Things like Bitcoin and, and SPACs and all that stuff doesn't give do the public markets any favor. And I think people in private markets feel like that they have good managers on their behalf, working to underwrite the risk that they're taking, that they're not taking unnecessary market volatility in their book, and that uh, and looking towards a more uh, sort of pre-public everything philosophy, which overtook markets in the 20, 20, uh, 2000s to 2010, and looking for some things to strike a better balance between uh, public and private and volatility and risk. And so while we'll continue to see, in my opinion, that illiquidity premium declined to some degree, it's because there's good reason people want to get you know more rational pricing of risk and not the daily swinging back and forth due to whoever's uh, got the meme of the week on Robin Hood and how it impacts things like Hertz. So um, I, I think that the, the risk premia uh, doesn't have to be particularly large now because of the volatility of the equity market. I mean, that public markets have. <laughs> Tim, I'll hand it to you. Sorry. Yeah, Don, that was, uh, that was right where I was going as well, because I think we've got to think about it. I think we've got to think about it, about volatility of liquidity. And, uh, you know, if you can invest with a horizon of, you know, investment horizon that, and match maybe liabilities or match your investment horizon, why would you take public liquidity wholeheartedly? Because that's where the volatility is. That's not based on pricing and valuation and liquidity is not based on um, actual underlying risks. It's based on systemic risk and the binge and purge of policy as well. So it's not even based on economic factors. It's not based on fundamental factors tied to a company or a structure. Oftentimes it's based on kind of the whims of uh, where the market wants to take it. And of course we know uh, there's much more you know, leverage in the system as we get late in the cycle that's able to uh, flex pricing and change things just with flows. So I think we think about it as uh, far as volatility of liquidity. And then again, I think we think about it as far as stability of capital. Well, I know we think about it, that's how we think about it stability of capital and where those sources are going to be not only now, but in the future. And right now there's so much dry powder, you know, in the private equity space, there's 600 billion of dry powder looking for acquisitions, LBOs and acquisitions to uh, bolt onto existing holdings and, and companies. But there's only about hundred billion of dry powder in the private credit middle market space. So we're well under um, 
under capacity versus what we could need to be if the private equity market uh, really deploys all that capital. Um, but there's more capital being attracted to Don's point. There's more capital coming in through interval funds. There's more capital coming in through BDCs, through just separately managed accounts and uh, other relationships. So that liquidity premium on a secular trend will continue to decline. On a cyclical trend right now, as we get later in the cycle, that liquidity premium will likely decline as well. But I think it's very, very reasonable to uh, expect it to decline. In fact, um, you're getting paid. I think this is, if you have the liabilities and can match the investment horizon, this is an exceptional opportunity compared to the risks you're taking when you compare it to what's going on in the public market where the risks are unforeseen and based on things outside of the control of any underwriter or analyst for that matter. Okay, thanks, Tim. And given that increasing demand for alternatives and private credit, um, will the value still persist relative to public credit or general public fixed income? Question for you, Rob. Yeah, I I thought about it from the context of just like EROA assumptions. So when, when I think about like, you know, how are, you know, portfolios and endowments or corporate pensions sometimes are managed, you know, it's usually like in a 60-40 context and you have a 40% that's allocated to like the US Ag. So I, I went and looked at the US Ag, it's got like a duration of six and a half years, spread of roughly 50 basis points, yield to worse of like one and a half. Um, if, if that doesn't scream the need or thirst for yield, when you look at trying to get to EROA assumptions, I don't know what does. So um, we, we, you know, when we're thinking through and trying to, you know, how can we still be relevant and try to think about how can I get to a six to 8% type target? I've got to... I've got to be thoughtful in allocations. And the, and the ways that I think you can be thoughtful is either you know, rather take you know, either credit risk, take leverage, take your liquidity. And look, I, I, I'm, a, I'm much more comfortable leveraging a higher quality asset in order to get to a return expectation. And then additionally, if I can get to, uh, if, if I can take some illiquidity premium to still be a contributor on my, in my credit portion of the portfolio, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that because of the fact that when we look and we score managers across times, so we're looking through their track record. We're trying to see, um, you know, what's been their expected loss rate. I mean, I realized loss rate, excuse me. And we're then trying to look at, you know, relative to the, the public comps. So I absolutely believe that, uh, that the need and thirst for private credit is just going to only increase over the coming years. Done. Yeah, I agree with Rob. I think we're going to continue to see the desire for different types of private lending is either to expand the bucket, not just, again, as I said, think of it as a corporate credit only, but you know, other forms of private lending, whether they be our example of residential credit, you know, corporate credit, I think you'll see in, in continued desire. Um, could even imagine a private, a more aggressive and larger private muni market in the not too different future. Because what's happened to the public fixed income market is it's become, it, it's a beta only market, arguably a beta minus market. Um, it's been indexed to hell. Um, there's little value and little uh, incremental return for active management in that space, in our opinion. And the penalty of volatility of pricing, as we talked about earlier. Um, and as a result, I expect to see us continue to see the growth in more. Um, investor-friendly, more direct lending markets, broadly speaking. And, and a shift away from uh, the uh, public markets, broadly stated, because of, as I mentioned earlier, whether it be the bubble phenomena, the volatility that goes along with pricing, and the lack that, of value add that a manager or an allocator can bring to it. And Tim. Yeah, and I'll, I've mentioned some of this before, but I do think, I do think in, Borrowers, whether it be in credit or in structure, are going to want the certainty of financing as well. So I think as, as Rob brought up, Bombardier went to the private uh, credit space from public. We're going to see more and more public deals shift uh, because of the demand, the certainty of financing, the relationship lending, uh, the deals not being so strewn across passive investors and hundreds of investors. So I think we'll see that. In addition, I just think we're going to see the continued proliferation of products that can help deliver not only to institutional clients and uh, through CLO and other structured product, but then can deliver into the retail platforms um, in addition to high net worth and non-resident alien. I think these interval funds and other things are going to be more um, proliferated and, and just in a good way, uh, continue to expand that access because most investors 
have a long-term investment horizon. These, these funds and these products and structures kick off a lot of income. Uh, so there's a lot of benefits, a lot lower volatility. So I think everyone should think about this in an efficient frontier concept. Look at the correlation benefits, look at the lower volatility generally, true lower volatility. Um, and, and I think you know, it's very, very reasonable and should be expected that everyone will be adding, just about everybody will be adding uh, these private credit assets to their portfolios more and more through time. Hey, thank you. Let's talk about structured credit specifically. CLOs in particular, but also ABS of all flavors, have seen some of the most robust demand since the end of the great financial crisis. So to what do you attribute this? And where do you think we might see interesting market developments going forward? Don, that one to you. So I think we've seen a particular surge in demand most recently. Uh, but I think that uh, that surge in demand is a part of a uh, a process of increasing demand for structured credit. I think this is generally speaking the product of its good performance last year, uh, the, the persistent lower level of defaults that have been the marketplace. Uh, and as uh, we've talked about earlier, the ARB and CLOs has never been more attractive. So as a result, people feel good about the quality of the underlying assets as well as the spread that's built into them. Uh, but it's really about the people buying as a hunt for yield. So all we've talked about throughout the, the, this conversation is that monetary policy being persistently low uh, to help generate growth has really been creating a global hunt for yield concurrent at a time when, as Rob pointed out, we're already going into this highly liquid with a high global savings rate. And so that is driving demand for these type of assets in particular. Um, and uh, the demand is so high that we're seeing it in the past as a CLO issuer. It wasn't too long ago that we all would pray for our favorite Japanese bank to come in at the tightest spread to buy our triple A's to make our equity work. And now you can have syndicated deals at great prices where you're just selling to insurance companies, or you can put some structural tweaks in it and you can get it sold to a bank. So there's never been a broader number of investors, it feels like to me in this space. Uh, and it is the global hunt for yield that's going on. All right, Tim. Yeah, I would echo a lot of that. I think, I think uh, CLOs and structures uh, like CLOs create a segmented market. So it really is able to be catered to the different investors around the world, whether it be uh, Japanese insurance companies or, or U.S. pension funds or whatever the case but I do think that's uh, really appropriate in that uh, some investors want to take the equity piece and some investors want to take the AAA and there's a piece uh, in between for everyone else as well. So, and part of that's based on true just risk return characteristics that are uh, being sought out and part of it's based on risk-based capital treatment as well. So a lot of these structures allow for, um, I don't know if I'd call it arbitrage, but allow for very favorable risk-based capital treatment relative to the alternatives with similar ratings that you can go directly into you know, public sector within fixed income, for instance. So I think that's really appealing. And I, I do think over time, we'll see more and more structures put around additional asset types, which we've talked about earlier. And I think that's, an, that's a way to more broadly distribute to investors. And I think more investors, granted this will cycle because we had synthetic CDOs, those kind of went away. We've had all kinds of different flavors and changes through the cycles. But I think overall, the investor base will continue to broaden over time and, and continue to make this an appealing um, mechanic and product for, uh, for delivering whatever the underlying asset or underlying asset classes might be. Thank you, Tim. And Rob? Yeah, so on, on, on CLOs, we uh, invest throughout all phases. Um, we invest, you know, you know, in the warehouse phase. We think the warehouse phase is, offers a great team, like, you know, low team opportunity IRR uh, on like a six to 12 month whole period. So when we think about, you know, some of the best risk adjusted returns, you know, that we could have in our credit portfolio, the, the warehouse phase is actually one that we really like a lot. Um, it's, it's done with new issue loans. Uh, you know, typically we're, we're also working with managers that we feel like you can print and sprint. Um, additionally, you know, on, on CLOs, the other things that I, that I really like about it is just the fact that while the market can be somewhat volatile, um, we really appreciate the tranching aspect. You know, for instance, like it takes almost like a draconian type scenario in order to break a single A or double A or even a triple B CLO. 
And while we saw some volatility in the last, um, you know, cycle, uh, we we were really, you know, pleased with the fact that the implied volatility did not match or even come close to, to meet, meeting the realized volatility. And then finally, look, look we've, we've we've talked about the equity aspect. Uh, we 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 you know. I, Really feel like it's a it's a strong return this year, um, but I but I just think like you know additionally on structured credit, the thing that I love about the markets is the fact that like it is it's tranched everything out. So if you really want to take risk, um, you can identify where you want to you know potentially, and then additionally you can always take leverage, you know, in order to get to your return assumption. So um, the structured credit is definitely um, an area I, I have intense love and, and focus on. Great. Well, thanks very much, everyone, for these great insights into the dynamics in the market at the moment. And we've received some questions from the audience, so I'm going to turn to those now. Um, the first one is, how have the dynamics within middle market direct lending changed over the years and since COVID? Um, Tim, I'm going to direct that to you. Thanks, Sally. Yeah, I think I would step all the way back to post-global financial crisis and you know, changes in regulation around banking, especially, that really caused banks to kind of step away from this middle market lending and for direct lenders to come in uh, to be able to lend to the companies that that were no longer being banked because they couldn't lend the leverage they once wanted to lend. Um, So I think we've seen that. So 10 plus years now. And some of those firms have been very, very successful and um, have grown significantly. So many of those firms have continued to move up market closer and closer to broadly syndicated. And as they've done that, as we talked about earlier, they're pulling deals out of what would have been the capital markets public groups from investment banks. And I think that will happen more over time. So the market in private credit will continue to expand at the upper end. And at the same time, there's still, um, we believe, a lot of tremendous opportunity where those firms have gotten large. They can't focus quite as much on the middle market or lower middle market. That's where we believe that the true uh, diversification and, and getting away from the beta is, is, uh, is there in that space. And we would say that uh, specifically, if we're looking at some of the changes recently in structure as well, uh, we've gone from banks that always kind of done a first lien. And then as other lenders got involved, they'd come in with a second lien or second lien MES funds would come in. And now over the last couple of years, it's really shifted to a bigger and bigger majority of um, senior stretch or unit tranche. So you're taking a first lien, adding in a second or a part of a second lien and creating a unit tranche. So you're giving the sponsor or the borrower one solution. They've got one credit agreement. They've got got one lender or a small group of lenders. It's very seamless. It provides certainty, provides uh, access to capital, provides a relationship lending that they want through all cycles. And so that's very appealing to uh, borrowers. And I think a trend that's going to be very established, continue to be very established, about 68% of all the deals done last year were Unitrons or Senior Stretch and, and probably going to 70 plus this year, maybe 75. Um, And I think then post COVID, um, I would say in addition, you know, things got really cheap and really uh, tremendous value, better covenants, better all of that. That's reverted quite a lot, but we still have that experience of COVID and how companies were able to navigate through that. What COVID adjustments were realistic, what COVID adjustments are not realistic, both things boosted revenue and earnings and things took down revenue and earnings. So that's really helping our underwriting experience and really allowing us to continue to focus on those kind of companies that have recurring revenue uh, that can kind of withstand not only traditional cyclicals, but uh, cyclical trends, but, but um, you know, shock uh, and events that may be uh, unforeseen as well. So uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of changes and continued nuances, but, uh, you know, continue to adapt and grow and, and meet borrower needs and investor needs as well. Thank you. Same question to you, Rob. Uh, Tim and Don, if, I mean, like I, I made my first allocation of private credit to direct lending in 2012. So um, I'm sure both Don and Sam have seen more, you know, cycles and opportunities and, uh, you know, things in, in private credit than I have. I, I think the, the biggest thing that I've noticed is just when we first started allocating, we were seeing, um, I think, a little bit more spread premium. Um, it was also more true first lien. I think we've been somewhat surprised, but also appreciative in some ways of the financial innovation uh, that's taken place, you know, when it comes to, it might be first lien, but it's also last out piece uh, where, uh, so, you know, managers also sold, you know, the first, first and, you know, first out uh, to somebody else, whether it be an insurance company or something else. Um, I, I'd say post COVID, um, I think that the, the biggest thing that, you know, sometimes keeps me up at night is adjusted EBITDA multiples. Um, you know, going back to the conversation we had in, 
uh, you know, earlier that the fact that, you know, I don't think any investment banker was, you know, forecasting um, a COVID-like in- environment with zero revenue. So I'm just more than anything, like I, you know, eyes wide open to, to certain situations and themes and just more than anything, want to make sure my managers are um, forecasting, but additionally underwriting their, their securities as much as possible and taking a, uh, you know, taking a real hard look at things from an underwriting perspective. Got it. Thank you. And Don? You know, I would say that uh, on a sort of more macro level, looking at this, as I mentioned earlier, the success of this asset class over the last decade or 15 years can only lead to the use of this technology in underly- other underliers. So again, uh, whether we see it in munis and resi, whether we see it in more spaces, I think you'll continually and increase see a strong preference to move away from the public securities market and more into this private lending style bucket for other types of things. Again, munis might be a great example. Okay, thank you. Next question from the audience. How are you capturing alpha and preserving capital in a low yield environment? Um, we'll go to Rob. Uh, we, we first of all, like we, we sort of quantify as a horse jockey situation. So when we think about the horse, that's like, you know, we, we, we look at, you know, a number of different asset classes, but we try to find things that we feel like have some sort of relative value in the market. Um, currently, you know, I, I'd say the public markets in general, we just don't see very much relative value. So it's sort of forcing us into the private markets in order to meet our return and yield expectations. Uh, then you look at the jockeys and the jockeys are the managers, right? So then you're going through and you're looking at just, you know, what the track record has been, what's the success aspects, uh, you know, how, what the realized loss rates that we talked about earlier. Um, and then just like, you know, looking at the teams and, you know, trying to, to identify, um, you know, we're, we're just more than anything, like, you know, I, you know, just on that, you know, horse jockey situation, what, what I really want is I want to mutter. I mean, like, you know, a, a, a horse, you know, and jockey that's good in all situations and can hopefully get to the returns that uh, we need to, um, you know, private credit over the long term. Okay, thank you. Um, Don, have you got a better analogy than the horse jockey one or any no, other? I, 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 I'm sitting here winding up already. Um, first of all, I didn't think of myself as a jockey till today. Uh, but now that I am a jockey, let me tell you, as a jockey, you want to make sure you have a good horse because there's no point in going out on a bad horse. And so with that, what we look for is what we call trend harvesting. We look to be in asset classes where we think of long tails. So that's how we ended up in single family rentals in 2012 when you know it was pretty lonely being in that business back then. Nobody thought that was a real industry. It was a trade. It wasn't an industry. Um, and clearly last year was the best year we ever had in that space. And so um, we, we think there continues to be things that the capital have had a hard time getting into. Uh, we look for trends where there's going to be growth and demand that's fundamental and not liquidity driven. So we had a long view that we didn't have enough houses versus the number of people who are going to want to have families. And we think the opportunity plays out in everything in land, lending, single family rentals, home construction. And so we continue to look for trends like that that are resilient to fiscal policy and monetary policy because they are longer dated than uh, one administration or two or Democrats or Republicans. So we continue to see that in housing. Gotcha. Um, Tim? Yeah, I would say we're definitely uh, focused on those secular trends as we do our underwriting in uh, individual companies and credit. And I think one thing that's been talked about, you know, as we get later in the cycle, there'll be a propensity for sponsors to stretch on valuations. There'll be a propensity for certain lenders to stretch on valuations and where they're going to lend to at what attachment point. And that's just something that we're not going to do. So I think it's key. Uh, there's, there's plenty of opportunity. We're going to get paid plenty for the credit risk we're taking and the liquidity risk we're taking in all environments, I believe in private credit. Right now, I believe it's exceptional compared to uh, some environments because of how rich public assets are. But, but it's essential that we continue to stay focused on underwriting, underwriting to the downside, both compressing enterprise value, compressing cash flows and margins, and uh, you know, challenging that to a uh, you know, worst case scenario, whether it be a cyclical downturn or some kind of um, event that's systemic or otherwise. So. That's key to us as we compress and look at the downside. 
And, and we'll continue to stay focused on first lane, senior stretch, and unit tranche. Uh, we can do second lane and mezzanine. But right now, we're just not seeing a lot of opportunities. And it would have to be you know, exceptional companies where we would take that exposure at this point because we're, we're getting paid well to take uh, you know, first lane exposure and first lane credit risk. Okay, thank you. Um, as journalists, we are always looking for signs of excess risk taking. Um, the next question from the audience asks, private credit has seen an enormous growth in the post great financial crisis period. Do you see signs of crowding, excess risk taking or weak underwriting? And if so, in which sectors? Um, let's go to Don. Well, I'm sure that my colleagues, our panel members will have more uh, specific insight. You know, whenever I've seen a business grow as fast as this one, it's prone to have some managers take excess risk and underwrite um, weaker credits as a way of either differentiating themselves or leaning into risk. Uh, and I think we've already seen some managers who didn't fare as well over the course of the last year um, have challenges like that. But generally speaking, uh, again, I'd say uh, I think the sector has done uh, extraordinarily well. We haven't seen as much as excess risk taking as I've seen in other markets that have grown as rapidly as this. And so uh, I remain confident that there remains good opportunity in the space. Okay, thank you. Tim? Yeah, I would say there's no doubt there's increased competition and uh, in, the, in the middle market direct lending space and in private credit generally, more managers, more capital coming to the space, more uh, demand to get capital deployed. And so I think there's more and more apt for some managers to, to want to kind of change their process or, or procedures and policy and be willing to take a little more risk, uh, give on covenants, give on pricing, give on terms in general. And so we're seeing that at the fringes, but nothing too dramatic. And we just got refinanced out of a first lane position. It got moved to cub light position, lending at seven times leverage. And so we're not rolling into that opportunity and uh, we like the company, but that's just getting stretched beyond where we think there's value. So I think remaining disciplined, uh, knowing there's going to be opportunities down the road is what's key. And, and definitely, as we've talked earlier, valuations will continue to get stretched as we get later in the cycle and public markets get stretched further. That'll, that'll bleed over, especially into the larger part of the uh, middle market space and private credit in general. Okay, thank you. And Rob, risk? Excess risk side? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing that we sometimes see is that if it's like a healthcare or a software deal, I mean, it's you can get all sorts of leverage and additionally the the bid by by some of the private credit managers in order to win the deal is is pretty strong. Um, I think the biggest concern sometimes that we have is like when we look at the, the broadly syndicated markets and we see 84% of broadly syndicated loans is cover light. Um, and additionally, that's 50 basis points tight of where, uh, you know, deals with covenants, you know, take place in the broadly syndicated markets. Uh, that gives us a bit of concern. I mean, like, I, I, I'd also add that, you know, one of the reasons we participate in private credit is we expect better, better underwriting. So for me, um, you know, one of the scare points that I continue to hear sometimes is just that sometimes a private equity sponsor, you know, asks for a turnaround notice of five days. So you have diligence light activities that sometimes take place from some of our private credit credit managers in order to want to deal. Um, those are things that you know give us pause and concern. We want to make sure that you know our, our private credit managers they're doing everything they can in order to earn their fee and also minimize and mitigate losses. Got it. Five days sounds longer than some I've heard of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. But great. Thank you, Rob. OK, thank well, you. I think that concludes things for us here. So I'd like to thank our panelists, Tim, Rob and Don, for joining us today um, and sharing your thoughts and to the audience for your support. It's been a pleasure, everyone. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.